Tonight, we established a simple principle whoever hurts us, we hurt him. Expanding regional tensions as Israel continues its war to eliminate Hamas from Gaza. And will we see a Biden-Trump debate? The latest on the 2024 race for the White House. Plus, kidnapping children, deporting children, and brainwashing them and weaponizing them. The shocking story of how Russia is kidnapping kids from Ukraine. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. President Biden weighing in on growing concerns of an impending attack on Israel, saying he expects Iran to strike sooner rather than later. Good evening and welcome to Faith Nation from the CBN studio in Washington, D.C. I'm John Jessup. Well, the Middle East is on edge tonight, waiting to see if war in Gaza will turn into a wider regional one. Israel says its military is on high alert and that it's ready for any scenario, as U.S. intelligence officials warn Iran could strike in a matter of hours. Axios reporting tonight, Tehran has sent a strong warning to the White House, stay out of the way or face new attacks on American regional forces. The United States is not retreating, promising to give Israel everything it needs to defend itself. We're watching this very, very closely. Uh, we still deem the potential threat by Iran here to be real, to be viable, uh, certainly a, a, a credible, uh, and, and we're watching it as closely as we can. Right now, our focus is on having conversations with our Israeli counterparts and making sure, not just conversations, but making sure uh, uh, that they have what they need uh, and that they're able to defend themselves. Top American General Michael Eric Carrilla is in Israel right now helping coordinate a military defense. U.S. officials told the New York Times they believe Iran will try to strike multiple targets inside Israel but didn't elaborate on specific targets. They suspect the threat will come in the form of missile attacks. Iran has publicly and repeatedly vowed revenge for a strike on its embassy in Damascus, Syria last week that killed several top Iranian commanders. Analysts say Tehran wants to calculate a response big enough to impress, but one that also will not trigger an all-out war with Israel or the United States. Well, one of Iran's most dangerous proxies is right on Israel's doorstep. Just today, Lebanese terror group Hezbollah launched dozens of rockets into northern Israel. It's a scene that has played out nearly every day since October. 80,000 Israelis have been forced to evacuate, unsure of when they'll return. CBN contributor Chuck Holton has that story. Kibbutz Yifta sits only two kilometers from the Lebanese border, and its people have been living in hotels since early October. It appears they may not return home anytime soon. I think it, uh, the less safe I feel is right here on the road. Um, but I have faith. When I was alone with the kids, the room was fine, and I wanted my kids to be close to me because they were frightened and they had uh, anxieties um, before they would go to sleep and they asking about dad. But now when he came back and we are in this little room, and it's very crowded and it's very small, and we're trying to, to be thankful for, with the things we have. We have each other. The close proximity of Yifta to the Lebanese border, however, adds to the sense of fear about going home. With the escalating conflict, these residents are pressuring the Israeli government to do whatever it must to allow them to reclaim their lives. We are much closer to the border than most of the kibbutzim in, in the Gaza Strip. It's, it's scary, I must say. And we need to be sure that we're safe in order to come and live here again in our homes. So this is uh, our request from our government, from our army. Please make us safe. The day-to-day -day uncertainty takes a toll. Ongoing missile attacks from Hezbollah, despite Israel's commitment to wipe out the threat, leaves many here feeling powerless. Like every day I was crying. I'm trying to think, like every time I feel like I don't have enough perspective to see the whole picture because I lived day, day by day, not even day by day, and hour by hour. Because uh, I don't know, every morning I wake up and I'm, I'm not sure how things are going to, to go in the country with the war. And I feel like I have no control on life. 
Hezbollah commander Hassan Nasrallah gave a speech the day after the attack on Beirut, saying that it was a crime that would not go unpunished. Meanwhile, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari of the IDF says that his troops are prepared for any scenario. That kind of talk adds up to the likelihood of an extended displacement as the hope for a secure return home remains tied to the IDF's ability to remove Hezbollah from southern Lebanon. These folks realize that may be out of reach without an extended ground invasion. This will take a very long time. That's what everybody keeps saying to us. That's what um, the messages that we're receiving is that this will be, this will take months, months, months until we have to just wait and hope that the war with Hezbollah will create some kind of safety net for us to be able to return home because without that, we will not be returning to our home in Iftah. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chuck. Now to the fight against terrorism right here at home. The U.S. House passed a bill to reauthorize a critical national security program under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, better known as FISA. Lawmakers passed the bill with overwhelming bipartisan support, despite earlier pushback from Republicans. It permits the collection of electronic data from non-U.S. citizens without a warrant. As CBN's Brody Carter reports, the FBI director warned it's vital to keeping Americans safe. Supporters say Section 702 has been pivotal in preventing kidnappings, assassination plots, identifying hackers, and targeting terrorists. Let me be clear. Failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. FBI Director Christopher Wray warns the terror threat in America has escalated following the recent attacks by Hamas operatives in Israel on October 7th. He warns bad actors could draw inspiration from such attacks in the Middle East. There was already a heightened risk of violence in the United States before October 7th. Since then, we've seen a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations call for attacks against Americans and our allies. And he warned of a possible coordinated attack, like the one launched by ISIS-K gunmen, killing 139 people at a concert hall in Moscow. FISA authorizes spy agencies like the CIA, NSA, and FBI to gather data from U.S. tech firms to track national security threats based overseas. This also sometimes results in the collection of data about Americans who may have interacted with these targets. It helps us find out who these terrorists are working with and what they're targeting and we made and it's what we need to stop them before they kill Americans. 19 House Republicans blocked a procedural vote on a bill Wednesday to reauthorize FISA, saying they want warrant requirements which would help ensure Americans' privacy. But critics say those new measures could slow down the U.S. terror investigations. Former President Donald Trump also opposed the measure, saying the FBI abused FISA to spy on his campaign. Brody Carter, CBN News. Thank you, Brody. The race for the White House heats up. We dive into the latest election news with Nathan Gonzalez next on Faith Nation. Welcome back. Nearly 300,000 Americans are getting a surprise email from the government today for giving their student loans. The White House announcing it will cancel an additional $7.4 billion in debt through pre-existing relief programs. The move is seen as an attempt to court younger voters whose support for the president is slipping over his policies in Israel. Meanwhile, Republican critics say taxpayers shouldn't have to foot the bill for Americans who took on thousands of dollars in debt. The White House says a total of $153 billion in debt has been forgiven and that it hopes to forgive some or all loans for 30 million borrowers. Borrowers, rather. Well, to the race for uh, the White House in 2024, will persistent inflation threaten President Biden's re-election bid? According to polling from the Pew Research Center, 73% of Americans say strengthening the U.S. economy is their top policy priority this year. But this week's Consumer Price Index showed inflation numbers higher than expected, something former President Donald Trump was quick to capitalize on, Blaming, placing blame solely on his successor. 
Biden has totally lost control of inflation. It's back. It's raging back. And it's actually much higher because they exclude various categories. It's actually much higher than that. The number is out of control. Biden has no idea. Meanwhile, this week, in the wake of Arizona's abortion ruling, the Biden campaign is doubling down on its commitment to the pro-choice cause, spending seven figures on ads in Arizona tying former President Trump to the abortion restrictions now in place in the crucial swing state. Well, Nathan Gonzalez is the editor and publisher of Inside Elections and a Faith Nation contributor. He joins us now. Nathan, always great to see you. And yeah, live good to be here. On set. So, uh, you know, polls show that the economy and immigration are the top concerns for Americans. But you just look at what's happening. You've got uh, Vice President Kamala Harris traveling to Tucson in the wake of the Arizona ruling, uh, Biden's campaign spending millions on uh, abortion ads, and then President Trump today calling for lawmakers in Arizona to overturn the Arizona Supreme Court's ruling. Do you see abortion playing an outsized role in yet another election in 2024? The short answer is yes. I mean, I think it, it works for Democrats in a couple of ways. It motivates Democratic uh, the base voters who may not be excited about President Biden on, on other issues, but it also could be for independent voters, appeal to independent voters who are concerned that if you give Republicans more power, they're going to go even further in restricting access to abortion. And with this Trump coming out for states' rights, I think that was his, his effort to kind of do away, to, to have the issue go away, and then immediately you have this Arizona decision that brings it up back to the front and center again. It's been interesting to see uh, even politicians like Carrie Lake, who once supported the ban, now actually backtracking. J.D. Greer, the former head of the Southern Baptist Convention, posted this today uh, in response to Trump's opposition to national ban. I think we have a graphic to show. He said, President Trump's statement betrays the heart of the pro-life movement. What President Trump said is not pro-life. It's basically just less aggressive pro-choice. Nathan, we saw similar statements from uh, the SBA, uh, 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 SBA pro-action uh, group earlier this week. Could this potentially threaten President Trump's evangelical base that's been with him all along? On one level, it could, right? And uh, to a nor if it were, an if Trump were a normal candidate or normal person, I would say yes, there's a threat. But by and large, white evangelicals have have deemed Trump that he can do no wrong, and that they will find other ways to either be grateful to him for the Supreme Court justices that help overturn. Roe v. Wade, or they have trust that when it really comes down to it in a second term, that he's going to be on their side. So we, you know, you hear this frustration a lot, but when we get to November, I think that by and large, you know, white evangelical voters are going to vote 80% for Trump like they, like they have in the past. Speaking of Trump, next week, his hush money trial begins up in New York. How much do you think this case will detract from his ability, not only to campaign, but to effectively make the case that he's the right person to elect back into the White House in 2024? It's going to be an interesting contrast because you're going to have Trump on trial and Biden on the campaign trail. And at this point, Trump believes that these legal issues are helping him. It helped him through the primary. I think he's leaning into them and, th and thinks it'll help him in the general election. But I'm not convinced that if this trial or other trials start and he has extended time, that voters in the middle are really going to be... That's what they want, you know, moving forward. Mm. I think they want someone who's going to be focused on the issues, kitchen table issues that they're dealing with and not be have this other sideshow going on. Nathan, speaking of contrast, we only have a few seconds left. The question that many people are asking is, will there be debates between President Biden and President Trump uh, this coming fall? It's hard to say that there won't be because it seems like we've always had them, but there are a lot of... Uh, unanswered question. I'm going to go with yes, there will be at least one debate, but it, that is not a certainty at all. And do you think there are going to be a lot of preconditions? Uh, yeah, there always, there <laughs> always are, but yeah. I, for Trump to avoid the spotlight, I think will be a pretty major... He avoided the primary spotlight because right. he felt like he was above it, but I think he's going to want to be in that spotlight and show that he is stronger than President Biden. All right, Nathan Gonzalez with Inside Elections. We always appreciate your time and insights. Thanks Thank you for, for having us today. Well, coming up, gone in an instant, Ukrainian children kidnapped by Russian soldiers. We speak to survivors when Faith Nation returns. Welcome back. Moscow is launching repeated assaults on Ukraine's energy grid, blanketing more than 200,000 people in a cloud of darkness. On Capitol Hill, Speaker Mike Johnson is in high-stakes talks with the White House to secure more funding for the war-torn nation. President Biden has asked Congress for billions in aid to Ukraine. 
But the measure has been stalled for months by Speaker Johnson, who is facing an open rebellion from some members of his own party. Conservative Republicans have vowed to oust Johnson if he agrees to more funding. Meanwhile, Ukraine says it desperately needs more Western support or risks losing the war. Key fears Moscow will launch a new offensive over the summer or possibly even sooner. Well, one of the darkest aspects of the war in Ukraine is the thousands of Ukrainian children who've simply vanished. Many are stolen from their homes or taken from their families. Incredibly, some of these children have escaped and are sharing their stories. My Faith Nation co-anchor Jenna Browder spoke with three teenagers now using their voices to raise awareness. It's a war now entering its third year. After Russia invaded Ukraine, Denis, Lisa, and Rostislav of the Kherson region saw their lives upended. How did your kidnapping happen? One day, some of my teachers came and said that all of us should be going to Crimea to the camp. Then I wait, went home, and that day in the evening, the Russian military came to my house and said that you had no choice, you're going. That camp and 42 other Russian facilities went about indoctrinating kidnapped Ukrainian children. They forced uh, children to love Russia in these camps. They forced children to sing and to learn Russian anthem and Russian songs. And if you resist, if you wouldn't do it, uh, they um, could punish you or uh, even to put you in some family, some foster family in Russia. Were you afraid that you could have been adopted or what, what do you think would have happened to you had you not been rescued? After the camp, I was moved to occupied city Gnichisk, and uh, I was forced to go to some college there. And I knew that they um, they were going to get me a Russian passport, and they were looking for foster family for me. Ukraine has accused Russian President Vladimir Putin of fast-tracking citizenship for kidnapped Ukrainian children. And the International Criminal Court has issued a warrant for Putin's arrest on war crimes charges in connection with these kidnappings. I was suffering uh, from psychological abuse uh, a lot of time because when teachers, caregivers and psychologists there knew that my mom was going to come and bring me back, uh, all this period they were like, pressured on me that it's, it was all lie, that my mom wouldn't come. All three teens say they suffered abuse in the camps. For Dennis, who's diabetic, he was told he wouldn't get his medicine if he didn't obey. There was an accident when this Astahov came to me and said, if I wouldn't obey to Russia, I just uh, would die in this camp because of my disease. Perhaps the most alarming story is Rostislav's, who refused to sing the Russian national anthem. If you say no for the first time, you should, you must write an explanational paper why you do want to sing the Russian anthem. If you refuse for the second time, um, you will be having this uh, private conversation with this policeman Astahov. If you refuse for the third time, you will be put in some solitary confinement. His third refusal led to more than two weeks in solitary confinement. Their stories are the stories of thousands of Ukrainian children. Ukraine has identified at least 30,000 children who have been deported to Russia, but it's feared that number is actually much higher. Because we can't identify a lot of kids who've been kidnapped from Mariupol or from another occupied territories whose parents were killed or prisoned or disappeared and Russia don't want to give us any information about these children. Mikola Kuliba began Save Ukraine, an organization that's helped rescue hundreds of these children. We are telling that Russia committing genocide, kidnapping children, deported children, and brainwashing them and weaponizing them. All children who live now on occupied territory or in Russia Federation, horribly brainwashing. He says Russia's goal is to erase their identity bit by bit. They give children passports, Russian passports, birth certificates. They adopting children after giving them Russian citizenship. 
all this system works for erasing identity, for converting Ukrainian children to Russian children, uh, and then weaponize them um, through their different military movements. Save Ukraine helped rescue Denis, Lisa, and Rostislav. Lisa, how did you finally escape? Uh, my mom came to me to bring me back, and she was forced to sign lots of papers. They were checking her. I was happy. I ran uh, to her to hug her. I was crying. And then after that, there were, was a very long and hard road home. The specific details of their rescues have to be kept private. Mikola calls it an underground railroad. All three are now receiving rehabilitation at Save Ukraine's Hope and Healing Center. It's a six-month program to help them and their families get back on their feet. They came to Washington with Save Ukraine to raise awareness for the thousands of other children still being held. We're asking everybody who could help, help us to help Ukraine survive, help Ukraine win in this horrible war, and pray for us. <laughs> in Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Powerful story. Thank you, Jenna. Well, a rescue right out of the movies. We explain after this. Finally tonight, like a scene out of a movie, a group of three fishermen shipwrecked on a deserted island. Realizing their radio had run out of battery, the castaways came up with a plan to try to secure their own rescue. The anglers gathered palm fronds, spelling out the word help in the sand. For the next week, the men waited, surviving on coconut until a Navy recon plane finally spotted their signal. The help sign was pretty visible. Uh, we could see it from a couple thousand feet up in the air. A Navy P-8 aircraft from Kadena Air Base in Japan was able to fly over the island and confirm that there were indeed three people there. Once the Navy spotted the men, they were immediately able to drop down survival packs to allow the men to hold out just a little longer. The next day, they were able to conduct a successful rescue operation and the men were brought to safety. That is quick sharp thinking. Well, thank you so much for watching this edition of Faith Nation. We hope you have a great weekend. See you right back here on Monday.